I'm Ann Marshall, and I'm excited about being here today with Bobby Bow, who's in Central Florida. She's a studio artist with a long, prolific history of exhibitions and successes in the art world, and it's really fun to have you here today. Well, thanks, Ann. I've been looking forward to it. So how do we, how can we understand your, your uh, process as a studio artist? Tell, for people who aren't familiar with you, kind of let us into what that means for you. All right. Well, I refer to myself as a textile artist. Uh, I frequently call the works that I make textile collage slash art quilt, just because, you know, a long name is better than a short, easy to understand one. <laughs> uh, and the end product is going to be something that has surface design on fabric and it's going to hang on your wall. So it's not a bed quilt. It's an it's a piece of art that would be two dimensional and intended for wall display. So then going back to the beginning, how I get there, uh, I start with blank fabric. I create all of the images on my own fabric. I do all of that with acrylic paint and I use a, a bunch of different methods, which we can talk about if, if, if you want, you know, um, silk screen and stamping and resist and direct painting and monotype printing, all kinds of ways to get the image on the fabric. Then I've made the parts. Uh, I don't just make parts in advance willy nilly to fill up my shelves. I have a very small stash of fabric that I've created because I generally create for a specific piece. I've planned the composition, I have a concept in mind and I make fabric for that particular piece. Then I collage it together. That means I use glue instead of iron on or applique or other methods that some other quilt artists would use to attach their pieces to the substrate, the backer fabric. Um, and then I stitch on a, a sewing machine. So the pieces are stitched together with joining seams and I also have quilting over the whole thing. And when it's all done, I will frequently do some more painting on the surface. So it uh, has the characteristics of a quilt in that I generally bind the edges and put a fabric backer on it. It hangs from a quilting rod the way most quilts do. It's a little stiffer than most art quilts um, so because it has all that acrylic paint on it, but I can still roll it up to ship it. So I've ended up making something that's both a coll has collage characteristics and art quilt characteristics. Just to keep it simple. <laughs> Hmm, hmm. Boy, it sounds like there's a lot of different steps involved. And that amazes me because I've been to your studio and I don't know, maybe it's a, a 14 by 14 room. I mean, you size of a little single car garage. It used to be a carport and we filled and we closed it in as many people in Florida do. You yes, pack so a lot into a small space. So I do pack a lot into a small space, um, which is challenging. Um, but, you know, it's just one it's just one of the challenges there. Um, I've come to think of these things not as limitations or constraints, but more like just another factor in how I'm going to make things. So, mm -hmm. for example, I'm not a long arm quilter. I don't have one of the great big machines that will quilt the whole thing after it's done. I have a little uh, portable sewing machine like you probably got in high school when you started making garments. And so if I'm going to make a big quilt and I'm going to quilt the whole surface, I can't reach the middle of it when it's done on my machine. So I have to quilt as I go. So that becomes then the construction of it is actually part of the design consideration. I'm thinking, where am I gonna make these parts go together so that I can quilt a section and then stitch it to the next quilted section and it will all go together seamlessly and it won't look like a mistake or a limitation, but like I wanted to do that all along. So I find that fascinating and challenging. So right from the beginning, you know, as I'm sketching out an idea, I'm thinking about how can I make these parts and put them together. Um, I like the fact that there's so many different things to do because it keeps me interested. I, you know, I think if I only did painting all the time, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be as interesting to me, but I love the painting as part of the process that I do now. And I really like the fact that everything I do is very hands-on. I mean, I'm really tactily involved in touching and moving and gluing and, and stitching and painting on the things that I'm making. And it helps me get involved with the ideas. I think you even work from three colors of paint and mix all your colors. Well, not just three, but I do have a very basic palette. I have a, a couple of reds, a couple of two reds, two blues, yellow, two browns, black and white. That's it. And I do mix all of my colors from that. And I, uh, and I love that. I like mixing colors. It's more interesting to me than getting the color out of the tube. 
Uh, and it also, I think when I see, you know, when I'm fortunate enough to see several of my works hanging side by side somewhere, I feel like it gives them some palette unity, even if I've gone a little one more one way than another on one quilt, they all kind of talk to each other. So yeah, I really, I love that. I'm thinking we could kind of call you a scratch artist. Sure. <laughs> Starting from scratch. <laughs> well, you know, part of that is um, I'm very frugal. I just, and it's philosophically pleasing to me to make a finished work that's going to go on the wall. That would be if someone purchased it, you know, a significant purchase, some thousands, but it started with very simple materials. I only buy two kinds of fabric, a sheer fabric and plain unbleached cotton muslin. Um, well, and then the felt for the backer. Um, but I'm gonna make everything out of those two fabrics. And I'm going to make all of my stencils myself. I'm going to mix all of my colors myself. Uh, I use, I mean, I'm, I'm just embarrassingly low tech in all of the imprinting methods that I use. And it's very philosophically pleasing to me. And it also doesn't bust my budget. I don't have to go out and buy a lot of stuff. Um, I hate to shop. Um, and so doing that as little as possible is just pleasing. It suits my personality. Mm. Well, I love on the website that you refer to, to see beyond the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I notice when I look at your art, that it really does draw the viewer in and there is the opportunity for interpretation in perhaps many different ways. What was your what was your intention behind that statement? And then how do you actually implement that? I think there were two things that came together. Uh, the first is that I really started working in textile art in around 2010. And it was just a time of great personal change in my own life. Um, I had retired, I was in the process of retiring from my uh, longtime career. Uh, I was ending my marriage. I was going, and as you do, as you go through times of change like that, you, I was very introspective. I had to go back and figure a lot of things out. How did I get here? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What does it mean? So it was a very introspective time of my life. I was in my mid fifties. Um, and that's a time that a lot of women experience change and thinking about things more deeply. So I started this kind of artwork at a time where I was just doing all of that kind of looking back anyhow and trying to figure things out. So that was an important influence. And then also because textile arts were pretty new to me in 2010, I had done other things and I had tried to, I had tried to build up a, a commercial business where I was creating artwork and selling it wholesale. And frankly, it, it had reached its conclusion and I flopped. I went to a trade show and I came back with zero sales. Well, you can't do that more than once. You know, that was a big money loss. So I thought I have to think of something new. So I was thinking of a new medium at the same time as I was introspective about life in general anyway. And as it turns out, when I started the medium of um, printing on fabric, I loved it right away. I just loved it. And like everybody who starts experimenting, I was so in love with the process. So for example, if you start, your, mono, your monotyping experiments with a gelatin plate and some leaves, as many people do. You will right away say, oh my gosh, these are the most beautiful leaves I've ever made. I could just look at these leaves all day. And I did. I printed lots of leaves. I thought they were fabulous and they were very, very important. And it's like the process of when you're an art student or a drawing student, the first time you learn how to do perspective correctly or how you learn how to do shading correctly. And you go, wow, I can make an apple that really looks like an apple. And that's extremely important skill to have and it's really interesting to you at a time. But one hopes that then you progress through it. You know, at a certain point I thought, well, I can make leaves now, but so what, what do they mean? And so thinking about how to use the images that I created with some thoughts that I had about life journey anyhow, they just went together. I started thinking about intentionally, you know, and I had a journal and I wrote things down and I drew pictures. How can I use these, the surface, pattern and color that I'm really loving creating so that it's not just pretty. <clears throat> and, and, and pretty isn't bad. I don't, I don't mean to demean that. Um, mm. But even in landscapes, there are many people who, uh, and in Florida, there are, there are beautiful landscape artists. Uh, I'm especially drawn to watercolor artists, you know, who capture the light and the feeling of the sky. And boy, there is nothing wrong with that. You could devote your life to making landscapes that are lovely. But that's not what interests me. I want to look at the landscape and think about hmm, 
What does this mean? What's going on here? What's it going to look like tomorrow? What was it like yesterday? Can I see things in this that are beyond just the surface loveliness? I, maybe that's just how I roll, or maybe that's it's as a result of where I was in life when I started the process that looking at uh, things underneath is what's interesting to me. And also, um, just as a personal reflection, as part of my uh, journey into understanding my own life better, one of the things that I realized that in my in my family and in my life choices, there was a big disconnect between what things looked like on the surface and what was really going on underneath. And a lot of that was unhealthy. And so stripping away just the surface and dealing more with what's underneath, that has a feeling of healthfulness to me to say, I, I'm not afraid to dig into what's going on here. So some of my pieces, especially about the journey of the young girl, um, have at, the, at least a wistfulness quality about them or um, some melancholy or uh, a girl who's hoping to be somewhere. She, she's not there yet. You know, it's not a lot of personal angst. I, I don't have abuse in my background. That wasn't part of my journey, but there was an increasing understanding. And so when people look at that, especially the depiction of the young girls, uh, people say the most wonderfully meaningful things to me, say to me. Um, they'll say, oh, that's how I was. Or maybe now they're seeing their own daughter or their granddaughter and saying, oh, my granddaughter Kelly, she's just like that. She's going through that. And so they can put themselves into someone else's journey. And, and that's, as an artist, gosh, what could be more meaningful? Uh, and it also directs some of my choices then. I don't want to make a piece that's so specifically autobiographical that it, it wouldn't mean anything to anyone but me. You know, I want them, I want it to be more as part of a story so that other people could see themselves in it. Uh, I have a couple of works that I've done of little girls flying, flying in different ways, uh, in a chair with their little feet stuck out and they're flying through the sky. Uh, I have another one of two girls flying in sort of an armchair and they've discovered magic socks. So really the only hot color in the whole piece is the little socks they have on their feet. Well, that's not autobiographical. I didn't really find magic socks and go flying through the sky, but I would have loved it if I could. And I dreamed of flying and, but that's a very universal thing. you know, people, that particular image of flying through the sky, lots of people love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes when I see some of the works that have the little girl uh, being involved with archetypes, I see the wounded child, the nature child, the magical child, the orphan child, and talk yep. about universal. Yep. That, I think that's the, the character that really does draw us in. They're, they're all in there. Uh, mm -hmm. I did give, um, sometimes I give myself away though. I was giving an art talk at um, the Ormond Museum last summer when they did a, a beautiful textile show and I was grateful to have some of my works in there. So I was looking at the little girl in the picture who has this little Buster Brown haircut, which is amazingly close to what I look <laughs> like now. <laughs> and so, you know, I pointed, there's her, here's me, see? <laughs> so obviously I'm infusing some of myself in there. <laughs> and you also have a quality of entitling your pieces that draw us in. I'm just in awe of the lyrical quality of your title, like music of the water or listening to the language of trees. I mean, how does that come to you? Well, thank you for asking that because it's something I take very seriously. <clears throat> so I, I could stand on a soapbox for just a minute to other people who are art makers and say, please don't give your artwork boring titles. You know, it just doesn't help your viewer. What meant something to you? You know, even if what you were doing was a still life, if you call it apple or an apple, I don't know why. Who cared about that apple? Was it the apple was shining in the sun or a Saturday morning and there was an apple? Anything would be more interesting to let me see what you're going for. And I have a personal pet peeve against untitled. I, I just think you're shirking. I'm sorry. I, I think if you go untitled number seven, you're slacking. Um, my soapbox. Um, so as to how I come up with them, Another um, discipline in my life is that I, I'm a pretty big reader now, more than I was when I was younger, because I have more time. I like fiction, and I have a special love of poetry. And so I generally start every morning with some poetry reading. And when I do, I just have a little notebook where I write down just a phrase or just a word or just two words together that spoke to me or they meant something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that inspiration by word 
it just has a natural go together with inspiration by image. So I may not always have like listening to the language of trees was one. I knew I, I knew it was something about trees. I knew that it that piece has a, a lot of squares with trees depicted in different ways, and they're all interacting with each other, some positive and negative. So it wasn't a realistic depiction of trees, even though the tree limbs themselves were printed with a, a screen that came from a photograph. It was more a feeling of trees. So that's kind of all I knew when I started. I didn't have the listening to the language of right from the very beginning, but I knew it was something about what the trees have to tell us or what we could see. And then one morning as I was reading poetry, and I, this may even have been Robert Frost. Sometimes, you know, the most traditional poets say the most beautiful things. And he's, he's you know, how could you not love Robert Frost? Um, he has a wonderful combination of loving images and wisdom and something about listening and something about language. Uh, I, I, so I just jotted that down. And next time I was with the piece, I looked at it and I said, that's it. I'm listening to these trees and the trees have a language. So that instilled it. And so it, it came together in the creation of a title. So if I don't always know the title from the beginning, but somewhere in the middle of the process, it usually comes to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that's, uh, just really great to soak up in terms of uh, my own future entitling process there. And, and then as well, you talk about when you're working with people, you kind of become a storyteller. And when you're working with nature, you're looking at art as an archaeologist. And those also have very big universal influences, storyteller, archaeologists kind of mining for the gold or or digging, you know, un uncovering the past or uncovering the stories. Yeah, in, in nature in particular, that was a conscious process. When I started, um, I, I did a series of work a couple of years ago when I was going to be a featured artist for our art festival here in Deland. And I was going to do a picture with leaves and a heron and some wading birds, things that are very popular and accessible. That can be a trap, making things that are popular and accessible. I mean, I love leaves. I love the water. I love birds and herons. So there are things I'm really drawn to, but one can almost get crass and say, oh, I think I'll put a palmetto here and a bird, someone will like that. And I, I don't want to approach the art in that way. So, and I was making a number of small pieces and I, and I do love to sell my work. So I'm, I don't feel ashamed about that. Um, but I had to consciously think, well, how, how am I gonna get beyond just sticking a waiting bird on it so someone will buy it. I want to have this be a reflection of what I feel when I'm next to the water or when I'm next to the river. And um, then I started incorporating, incorporating photographs in the surface of the piece, but not just the whole thing being a photograph. That just kind of opened up a number of ways of working to me because suddenly you were seeing uh, the, the viewer when they look at it, I, I think, uh, maybe even viewers who aren't that used to looking at artwork analytically, they see a photo and they're relieved. They go, oh, I get it. That's real. I know what that is. Okay, I'm attached to a real thing. Maybe they're confused by abstraction or they don't understand surface design. So they latch onto something real, but then next to it, they say, well, wait a minute, that's not real. That's stripes. That's pattern. That, that doesn't look like a real thing. But look, they're next to each other in the same surface, which is what it's like when you're next to water in particular. You have the real water, you have the surface of the water, you have things reflected in it. It's just fascinating all that's going on. So I try to keep that for those, that, that kind of landscape is more interesting to me. Or else when I make small collages, I'm trying to create an altogether not real landscape, uh, an abstract landscape, or more like a fairy tale landscape. So there'll be recognizable things in it. Then you'll see some trees, you'll see some birds, but uh, it's not like I went outside and sketched a real tree and then just reproduce that as is in the picture plane, because well, that's a wonderful skill and I admire others. It's just not what I'm interested in doing. Yeah, that reminds me of going back to your tagline of to see beyond the surface, you know, right. those internal and external elements becoming visible to certain aspects, I guess. Right, you know, when I talk to other art makers, sometimes I think in a, in a way too self-deprecating way, some will say, oh, I'm not that interesting. You know, I, I don't have deep thoughts that I would apply to my art, to which I say poppycock. You know, you have, um, it, to have meaning, it doesn't have to be sad. 
to have meaning, it doesn't have to be introspective about difficult times in life. You might have an unusual perspective on life that comes from joy. You know, you just may be a joyful person that you look outside and you were saying you went to the beach this morning and it, it did something for you. I was telling you, I looked out the window and saw a robin and it just thrilled my soul. Well, that's who you are, you know, and if that's where you are, it's more than just depicting a sunset. It's more than just depicting the robin. You could be all about showing people why that's joyful to you. Um, or a lot of people have a real sense of the internet connectedness of things, people that are uh, environmentalist and just, you know, look at what's being done to Florida's landscape and, and grieve because, golly, you know, we're just destroying it. We have destroyed a huge portion of it and more of it is going down the tubes. And if that's in your heart, in some way, even if you just deal with landscape things, I think you can make that come through. So I, I don't think people should demean their own self and say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not literary, I'm not academic. There, there's, you, you are something. There's something about you that's interesting, and you can find a way to put that into your artwork. Very, very powerful, very inspiring. And I'm struck with going back to when you said, when you got into the textile and painting, that's a relatively not too long ago time. It's well, only I've, been, I've been making these for just about 11 years now. And I'm stunned at your, one, the prolificness, I mean, and two, um, how far you've excelled in claiming your process, knowing your voice, and then also, you know, putting it out there. So you must have an extra, I don't know, an extraordinary practice, ritual, routine, or discipline. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. That's that's really nice and very, very encouraging. And those are the three parts, you know, claiming the process, learning how to make your medium work. And part of your, you can't wait until a voice falls out of the sky on your head. You're going to get your voice by working through whatever medium you want. And um, and then you have to put it out there. I had a thought that was coming from this. Um, oh, I, I go to work every day. I just can't help myself. You know, when I retired from a job where I had to get in the car and go someplace every day, now I had time every day and I wake up and think, well, it's time to go to the studio and make stuff. And for the most part, that's what I do daily. And um, it's part of why I, I love teaching and I love talking to people about art making, but I do not teach specifically how to workshops like step one, do this with a fabric, step two, do this with the medium. And I don't mean any crassness or meanness in this but what you do is you get in the studio and you experiment with fabric and glue that's how you do it there you go you just had the workshop it was free um there's there's nothing more i can tell you because i don't do anything unusual i don't have a process that's secret uh, i blog pretty regularly and i'm happy to show people how i do things and what the methods are they're, they're not going to i didn't come up with anything unusual i have very simple methods and very simple materials and you might choose different methods and different materials, but you know, if you're not happy with what you're getting, can I ask you how many hours in the studio you've put practicing? You know, are, are you really working this or have you not? And if you haven't, well, that's how you're gonna get better at your claiming your method is keep using it. And I think you can pick anything. If you love cyanotype, make that the passion of your life. If you love shibori, make that the passion of your life. If you like dying, make that what you do. If you like screen printing, make that what you do. There is no one process that is inherently better. Or, you know, if you're where you are in your career, you think about, oh, could I get into a show? Or, oh, could I get an exhibit? Or, oh, could I sell that work? Any of those things I just named would be fine. If you did a woodblock prints, boy, you could make beautiful woodblock prints for the rest of your life. So, um, it is fun to learn new techniques, and every now and then I'll add a new technique to my toolbox, but I'm not actively running around looking for the next technique because it's not about technique. It's about learning how to use whatever method most pleases you. You know, and if you found that eco printing or hand stitching or beading or drawing lines, any of those things that speaks to you most, be happy with that. Just keep doing it, you know, and then little by little, you might add some other thing to it. So it, it's not about chasing techniques. It's about learning to really use, really practice with what, what small techniques you may already have learned. You're a wonderful mentor in, in that respect. And I'm also impressed that, that if I understood you correctly, 
that you pretty much work on one piece at a time? Not exclusively, but once I'm in a piece, I, I, I work it till it's done. I, I don't have a stash of unfinished products. That, that would make me crazy. I, I, when I'm in there, I got to get the thing done. But there might be uh, several things in the works. When I'm working on small pieces, definitely. I work on three or four at a time when I'm doing little paper collages. Um, but on a big piece, maybe I'm doing something that has to dry or I have to wait and I can't do anything on piece number one. So I'll flip over to piece number two and work on you know preliminary stuff on it and then come back to piece number one. So I work on maybe two or three at a time in that sense. But as far as actually, once I'm in on it, I, I stay with project number one until it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems really quite focused. And I, and I know, sorry about that. I know a lot of people um, don't uh, actually have that kind of discipline that they that they um, can feel fractured or scattered and and I think the output is affected by that well I I want to show it to someone when it's done you know I had a good friend an artist who sort of talked about this process of becoming an artist and your first thing is you're little and you draw with crayons and you go whoa is that great and the next thing is you draw with crayons and you show it to mom and mom says oh that's great and she puts it on the fridge and you go, oh, I could show this to someone. They could look at it. And so if you like to do that, and I do, then you would make it, show it to someone, put it out there and hope maybe they would like to own it. Uh, so I, I can't get to step three unless I finish the work. So I, have to, I have to get it out there. Yeah, and I, it, is truly, it is truly an honor if a patron purchases one of my works. It's just the greatest thrill in the world to think this thing that meant something to me means enough to someone else that it's hanging in their home. It doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and on your website, you, you have uh, a lot of work that is available for purchase. You I do. also have workshops that are available, and you've written a book that's uh, on, or one or two books even, that include your artwork and poetry on Amazon. Right. I, they're, um, you can get them from my website. I have a, a small inventory here at home, so you can buy them from me directly, or you can also get it on Amazon. And I must be rich and famous now because I got my royalty check from Amazon last year, and I think I earned $30. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in the big money now. <laughs> and then... Um... So I really do encourage people to to go to the website because there's a lot of information in your blog. You can sign up for the newsletter. Thank you. And you're so generous in really helping to provide some foundation, some fundamental thought for people who are interested in making art to to really bring it to a, another level or to explore it deeper for for themselves to be. Uh, clearer about what it is that they're bringing into the world and that's there's that's a real gift that I think that you have well th thank you I, re I really appreciate that and um, I do correspond a lot with people who will you know read my blog or get the newsletter and uh, there's just a lot of art makers out there who are interested in doing a little better than they're doing now or going a little deeper than they're going now and not to say that I have all the answers but if you see one thing like oh that technique that would help me or you read one word and you say yes that will unblock a log jam I'm I'm thrilled I'm thrilled if that can happen that's good plus you have an open studio tour coming up I believe yes yes we ought to push that uh it's in the Deland area it's the weekend of March 4th and 5th so we're, we're recording this in 2023, so it's this year. And uh, in Deland, there are a number of good working artists. So there are 23 artists on the tour, and you go around to 20 stops. It's free. You decide which ones interest you. You make your own itinerary, and you can find all that information at artstours.org. That's arts with an S, tours with an S, artstours.org. There's a map and a list of all the artists, and we would all just be delighted to have you come visit our studios. So you got two days, Saturday and Sunday. Hmm. And I can attest to what a magnificent outing that is, having been, <clears throat> and the variety of artists. And uh, I think being let in kind of behind the black curtain is, is yep. just a, a real gift to get that intimate view and perspective of how people work and where they work in their own space. Oh, and I, I think art lovers... If, 
you don't have to be a maker yourself to find this an interesting thing to do. But if you just like art or you like art and sometimes you like to shop for art, seeing how it's made or knowing the person personally, it just it makes it so much more meaningful to you. And mm -hmm. on our tour, we're going to have jewelers and clay artists and painters. And I'm the only textile artist. No, there's another one who makes beautiful silk work. I uh, said, so it's just all kinds of different things to, to discover. Mm -hmm. And what are you currently working on now? Or what, what are you looking forward to? What, any projects on the horizon or something up? Well, short term, I'm getting ready for the studio tour, which means I have to make some small pieces. Oh, and I'm gonna have to clean the studio. I, I, I gotta do that. Um, <laughs> it, it takes a couple of days. Uh, longer term, I've just gotten really interested in incorporating still life objects into the large quilts. And I've just made some smaller pieces that have still life in them. And I think, mm, yeah, I think that works. A jar and a bottle and a canister, that kind of thing. And I'm not quite sure why, but it is, I feel compelled to do it. So I'm gonna follow it through. I think that it's sort of a logical conclusion of the journey. You know, if you can look at things on your kitchen table, a, a bottle and a jar and a plate, and they're pleasing and you like them and you just feel comfortable and at peace by being here with these simple things that feels to me like uh, a stage you would hope to get in the journey. You don't wanna be floundering in the woods forever. You don't wanna be the sad little girl forever. At some point, you, you wanna get home. And I think that's what these still lifes are saying to me. So I'm, I'm uh, doing still life, but then incorporating them into a background that still has some of those images that t seem to imply dreams and memories so there's still going to be some trees in there and some water in there with also the still life so i haven't made my first big one yet so i'm not quite sure how it goes but that's what i'm interested in <laughs> well i feel like we we've, we've had a little sneak preview here and i'm excited to be able to get an opportunity to to view that oh well, thank you and I look for making them and as we get uh closer to our time of uh, closing for today and, and before i ask you what you want the world to know is there something else that we want to make sure that we get across to people that might be watching and listening well i like to be an, an ambassador for textile arts and art quilts in general there are many many makers other than me who would call themselves art quilters and the variety of artwork is astounding. The quality of artwork is astounding. Museums and galleries have discovered this now. Um, and if you've never heard of that or you don't know much about art quilts, if you went to um, Saqqa, S A Q A dot com, that's the international organization that supports and promotes art quilts, your mind will be blown. You'll just have a chance to, you can just browse. You can look and look and look at all kinds of art. And I think someone who didn't know about that in advance would be thrilled to find out about this medium. And I'm very happy that it is increasingly an accepted medium. You know, people don't have to apologize for being a textile artist. It doesn't imply that you're crocheting doilies. Not that there's anything wrong with crocheting doilies, but if that's not what you're doing, you don't want people to think that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got chills thinking about somebody going to the Sakwa site for the very first time because it it is uh, mind blowing the, the quality and enormity of the, the people that are involved and um in a lot and, of and if you are a textile artist or you thought maybe what you were doing was kind of like textiles you absolutely need a community of people who will support you and encourage you and so i'm a big fan of sakwa so i encourage you to go take a look at that and know more about them mm, good good point very good point so in closing what what would be your parting words what what would you what do you want the world to know I want the world to know that good art is about something. It, it, it's about something. It's not just an image. And I, I think it's important, especially for students, art students, um, frequently the, the thing they're encouraged most is realism. They're learning how to render things realistically, how to depict things realistically. And this, of course, is a wonderful skill. If you can draw, it really helps you more. You know, you struggle. If that isn't what you know how to do, then you have to make your art in some other way. And that can work too. Um, but you got to get beyond those first things that you learn. You know, if you're a painter and you learn how to mix the glazes right, that's good. 
you know, if you're a watercolorist and you learn how to make the water work right, that's good. But why are you doing this? It has to be about something. So if you're the maker, it will mean all the more to you if you figure out what your art is about. And if you're a potential patron, it will mean all the more to you if you ask the artist to interest you, what is your art stuff about? Or you follow them till you know them more, your understanding of art will just deepen and deepen. So it's not just a depiction of something. You know, sometimes people will say, I can't be an artist, I can't draw a straight line. Well, who can? That's why they're rulers. Uh, it's not about a particular skill, it's that it's about something and communication is, is what should be happening. Mm, just beautifully put, and it really makes me think of, you know, how the, the audience that a lot of this goes to are people who are interested in the in the wisdom, the art, and the the conversation behind the art and the, uh -huh. the wisdom behind that. So that was just really so succinct and beautifully put. Well, that's good. And I, I appreciate you having a, developing up a community of makers and art lovers who are looking for something deeper in art. Go you. <laughs> what a joy to spend some time with you today, Bobby. That's thank been you. great. Thank you tremendously. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. And you can check out Bobby's uh, information um, below in the information box and, um, and definitely, definitely pursue um, meaning. Great. I would be happy to hear from folks. Thank you. Thank you. Best wishes.